Good afternoon and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Webinar Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen and I'm the program manager for the center and will serve as your moderator today. We would like to extend a special thanks to Bob Hollis of the Mobius Network for providing the webinar management software for this series and Lisa Ruggiero of the National Recycling Coalition for providing technical support. Today's webinar will provide an update on the recycled plastics industry. We have an excellent presenter today, Tamsin Edifa. Following her presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you do have a question or comment, please use the GoToWebinar dialog box located in the control panel on your screen. You may also use the dialog box to request assistance if you are experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar. Please note that an edited version of this webinar will be made available for viewing via YouTube links on the National Recycling Coalition and Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center websites. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Tamsin Edifa is Vice President of Sales for the Reedsville, North Carolina-based recycler Envision Plastics. Prior to joining Envision, she served as Division Sales Manager for KW Plastics Recycling currently the largest plastics recycler in the United States. Tamsin has more than 24 years experience in the recycling industry from collection to the reprocessing of plastics. She attended Southern Methodist University and Texas A&M University and has a Bachelor of Science degree in communications. Tamsin serves on the executive board of the Association of Post-Consumer Plastic Recyclers, also known as APR, and she also serves on their technical committee technical committee representing HDPE resident interests, as well as Walmart stores sustainability committee. Envision with sales of about $110 million a year, currently makes bottle and extrusion grade recycled high density polyethylene and is one of the country's largest recyclers of HDP bottles. It supplies color specific recycled resin through its patented process for color sorting the material. Envision also holds a non-objection letter for its EcoPrime brand recycled HDPE from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Envision Plastics was formed in 2001 after obtaining proprietary rights and patented technologies from Union Carbide and then acquired production facilities in Reedsville and Chino, California. In addition to the APR, Envision Plastics is a member of the Carolina Recycling Association and the National Recycling Coalition. And now, Tamsin, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm going to give you guys a little update on the green fence and some of the opportunities that have arisen because of the green fence and a little bit about Envision Plastics, uh, even though you've given me a great introduction of who Envision Plastics is. Um, color sorting, some of the technologies that exist out there, <clears throat> some of the equipment that's available for sale, the pounds per hour and the accuracy of those pounds per hour. Why it's important, why did Union Carbide even develop this color sorting technology and why we felt it was important to commercialize it. And what we feel the future of this color sorting technology is um, some of the other opportunities there are to color sort um, with caps and rigids, electronics, possibly opaque PET and some conclusions in regards to recycling plastics in general. So the green fence um, I think we all felt the implications of the green fence last spring of 2013, but the green fence is really part of a law that passed in 1996, but really wasn't enforced until the new prime minister came into effect. And he really did it as an effect to clean up his government as well as the environment. Um, so we may see this law soften. It has softened a little bit just because there have been some third party countries who've started taking in some of the materials China was taking in and started to push some of the materials that China was getting back into China but segregated. So that has happened. So there has been some opening up. But as the most part, China is really only interested in segregated materials and mostly interested in ground up material because inspectors think that is post-industrial, not post-consumer. So this chart showing you that major drop off that happened in 2013, which is an indicator of the green fence hitting. But if you really look at it, it dropped off in 2011. And this is just a personal assessment we had in late 2010. We had a 
a ban of material coming in from Mexico. And I think what happened there is that the Mexican scrap that was coming into the U.S. had to find another home, and that other home was Asia. And I think the Asian demand dropped a little bit from the U.S. during that period of time and, and got their new supply from Mexico. Now, of course, they got hurt by the green fence as well as we did. But I think that's why we started to see a drop off in 2011 as well as just in general, the economy in China is dropping off. So it's kind of a combination of the Chinese economy dropping, uh, the green fence hitting, of course, and the fact that China did find some new supply out of uh, Mexico as brokers needed to find a new home for the Mexican scrap. This slide is actually a picture I got from the Christian Science Monitor, and it's a picture of a woman who's cutting out plastic labels out of each bottle out of that mountain of plastic. And it's really an indicator of why uh, when magazines take pictures of these uh, people working with an actual infant in their arms cutting out labels so that this plastic can be chopped up and pelletized, it, and it humiliates the government. And so that's what causes them to do something. So again, you know, the prime minister and the Chinese government were embarrassed by pictures like this and started to act on it. But it's also, it's not sustainable. You know, humans can't live like this. So here you have a woman who is working day in and day out for $15 a day, cutting out labels out of plastic bottles. And the next slide, if you'll go to it, is really just showing what that residue looks like after they've gone through all these mountains of plastic. And literally then they have people go through the mountains of the waste trying to find what they missed. So it was creating quite a bit of leftover waste in their country. It wasn't just about, about polluting their lands, but also their water and their air. Um, so they're trying to do something about it as well as, like I mentioned, clean up their government because there were a lot of kickbacks going on to the government officials that were looking the other way by not enacting the 1996 law. And so he wanted to do something about that as well. So what's the opportunity here? The opportunity is, you know, uh, for us is in the domestic markets is to get the collectors of all these different plastics to start sorting. The problem is most MRFs aren't designed to take in anything more than bottles and tin cans and glass bottles and paper. I mean, we were designed to take six to eight commodities and we weren't thinking about taking anything beyond plastics, HDP number two and PET number one bottles. And the consumer wanted us to take more, so they pushed more on us. Single stream made it easier for consumers to put it in there. Uh, MRFs started bailing up this residual and selling it to China. China stopped taking it, so what's the opportunity? The opportunity is possibly for the paper mills that were out there sorting out different paper who's losing some volume to become a perf. Um, you know, they're not getting the volume they were once before because people aren't reading as much paper, newspaper, magazines. Possibly they could add to the space they currently have and start separating some of these plastics. Um, that's a possibility. It's a possibility that some of the sorting technologies I'm going to talk about in the future could be added to some of the MRFs or these possible PERFs to separate the material <clears throat> so that they can sell. But what I would suggest before taking on anything going forward is that you want to determine what these feed streams you want before you open up Pandora's box. Uh, rigid seem to be a good opportunity because critical mass is important and we've already assessed there's 350 million pounds being collected of rigid containers. Defining what a rigid container is is difficult though because, you know, is it a polyolefin mix? Is it a thermoform? Is it PET? Is it HDP? Is it polypropylene? Um, if you notice in the bottom right-hand corner, I've got more recycling than associates. They've been doing what's called a bale definition and um, <clears throat> a resin identification terminology. If you go onto their website, they may have it up, but they've been working with the ACC on defining what those terminologies are. Um, I don't know if they've been allowed to announce what we on a committee have formed as bale in polymer definition terms. Um, but with those terms, I'm, on the next slide, I'm going to show kind of what some of those terms and what those means are. But I would definitely say before collecting something new, picking your end markets are important. It always baffles me when people jump on a bandwagon 
for one end market and they don't know what that end market's end market is. So in a little while Envision is going to show you what some of my end markets are. You're going to see a lot of variety to those end markets. Some of the end markets in plastics are very seasonal. For example, you might have some <clears throat> end markets that are construction and are, are only viable during good weather months. You might have some end markets that are viable during the agricultural seasons. And that's okay. If that's the case, you might want to be prepared to stockpile some inventories and be ready to have strong demand during the times that those markets are strong. But making a business plan around that's important. Um, so before collecting some plastics that you haven't been collecting before and, and taking that on, I would highly suggest to get to know who your end market's end market is. Um, and also finding out that you have more than one option. You're going to find out that there are some in the markets that are very flexible. Uh, compression molding markets are more flexible than injection molding or blow molding in markets. They can take more of a mix of resin. Uh, one of the compression molding markets that might exist are pallets. There are only so many plastic pallets that can be made out there for certain types of industries. Uh, some of the plastic pallets that are being made out there need to go into food use for GMA and they have very specifics on what types of contaminants can be in there. So whereas that industry is growing, <clears throat> some of that industry is getting in trouble for using certain types of feedstocks because of the contaminants that are in there. So again, finding out how knowledgeable that mill is about their own materials that they're taking in and selling into the end markets that they're going into. So I would suggest that as well. So this is kind of a split of the non-bottle categories of plastics that exist out there today in percentages. Um, so, you know, they're the floatables from the PT reclamation or mo mainly polyolefins. They're the labels and the caps. And those are mostly polypropylene and polyethylene. Uh, you've got the electronic scrap being collected and those are mostly engineering grade plastics. You've got kind of the other mixed plastics at a 6%, but you've got the 22% at mixed rigid bale categories, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And then you've got 61% in segregated resin categories where people are purposely segregating that. And that number is large because it's got the most value, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Oh, excuse me. It's going to be the slide after that. What this slide shows you is that... Um, it doesn't matter uh, what the material type that you're taking, even if it's cardboard, if you can kind of see in the commodities market, they kind of all track each other. All these materials kind of go into packaging at some point or another, um, and they're recycling from packaging, so they kind of all track each other in supply and demand. So that's the interesting thing. It's just when they're all mixed together, they don't have much value. And you can, of course, see in 2008 when everything plummeted together and you can also see um, in 2011 when everything kind of peaked and, and also in early 2008 when everything kind of peaked. But there's always a little bit of a crash after a big peak but you can also see where the commodities kind of tracked each other so I thought that was an interesting slide to share. So this is the one where I, what I wanted to show you was before the green fence took hold and you had a commingled market you could see in January 2013 uh, where a commingled bale of all mixed plastic had a value of $140 a ton and then after the green fence it dropped down to $20 a ton. But on the far right when you did the most sort that you could do there was very little change between January and May of what that per ton total value is. So when you took you know and and separated all those different price per pound points, you got a cumulative of $293 per ton in January. It only dropped to $271 per ton. So it's just another reason for looking at sorting because you know that's accounting for the trash value in there as well. So you still came out ahead by sorting as opposed to commingling everything, but that of course meant there was an investment with there. And you know that comes with cost and one has to look at whether they can afford to do that. Um, you look at the other things where you're commingling certain things and not being as picky and there was still quite a bit of a drop as much as 50% um, on uh, the 141 to $74 a ton 
with doing just a slight sort, <clears throat> but commingling a lot of it, not really taking the trash out. And again, some of that probably was going to China or some low-end markets. So basically what this slide is showing you is that separating and selling into specific markets has the most value. So the future in my and Patty Moore from Moore Recycling and Associates, this is our dream future, is that in the future at curbside we'll have all rigid plastics will be collected, of course, maybe even extend, expanded polystyrofoam, maybe not. Maybe we'll have more retail drop-off programs beyond film. Maybe some other materials will be collected. I know Walmart's talked about doing some stuff like that. We'll have more special collection programs. Maybe we'll have uh, bulky rigid collection programs, maybe once a month from curbside. Maybe more electronic recycling programs collected. <clears throat> of course, we hope to see more increased commercial plastics recycling programs collected in the future as plastics recycling increases and involves. But more importantly, we hope that APR's design for recycling guidelines start to become more adapted by uh, packaging engineers and um, followed by these engineers. And we hope there's more standardization in um, some of the packaging. I hope to see you know, segments of the grocery store start to look at how they can start standardizing certain parts of their packaging because Technically, there's no reason why the dairy aisle that's refrigerated can't be all packaged in the same product instead of polypropylene polyethylene and low-density polyethylene and about 20 different melt flows. Maybe it all can be packaged in either polypropylene or polyethylene. And in the future, you guys won't have to think in the mark. You can just say, hey, if it's a dairy refrigerated product, it can be bailed together. And we can chip away at the grocery store aisle by aisle and do something like that. And and with design guidelines telling them, you know, what's recyclable and not. And then at another square, we'll have <clears throat> more perfs, like I talked about with paper recovery facilities doing some of the plastics recycling as well. And what can't be recycled can be reclaimed plastic to oil. And then we'll have increased demand for PCR, I hope, and it will remain strong. And then at the end of the day, all plastics will be recycled. So that's hopefully the future of plastics recycling. But all this needs to happen with technology increasing. And we feel some of that technology increase will happen with more IR scanning equipment as well as color sorting. So whereas I'm not an expert at IR scanning, Envision certainly has done its share of color sorting. So I thought I would continue in talking about color sorting and, and why we did that. So without talking just about Envision, I thought I would share who some of the top players in recycling are today. Um, it's a slide I give when I give presentations. Some of these people have gone out of business. That's what the OOB has stood for. Um, they've been bought out by other companies maybe and taken over and changed names. Um, I think the Coca-Cola Recycling is now uh, International Recycling Group has taken them over. And uh, the next slide are just the smaller tiered companies. Um, some of these people listed have gotten into doing some of the rigid. KW Plastics is doing some of them. Intrapex is doing some of the rigid containers. But this is a listing that you guys can go back to and call on some of these people and see if they'll take some of your plastics beyond bottles. I certainly don't mind uh, sharing who my competition is because if we all do a good job, there's plenty of plastic out there for all of us to recycle if we'd all recycle it. So I certainly want to encourage that. Um, and then unfortunately some of these people are out of business because either they picked just seasonal type markets and they couldn't withstand the, the markets when they weren't in business or, or they put all their eggs in one basket or they didn't run their business properly or they didn't make good quality. But for whatever reason some of these aren't in business anymore. So keep that in mind. So a little bit about Envision, we started in 2001. We did buy the Union Carbide plant in 1997, but we didn't have it, uh, the physical building. They only sold us their intellectual property, I mean their intellectual um, uh, patents and technology and their equipment, but not their property, so we had to move it somewhere. So when FCR had their plant up for sale, we thought we would get people and know-how, and we bought their plant and moved the equipment down to 
Reedsville, North Carolina, and six short months later, we bought the USPL plant that was in Chino, California. That made us a bi-coastal um, recycler, so we can buy nationally. And we just recycle today high-density polyethylene bottles. We have been looking at polypropylene for about three years now and have done several trials on trying to find the right critical mass of polypropylene to recycle that would be of good quality that we could utilize our color sort technology with. Um, so going into color sorting technology, I'll go on to the next slide and start talking about some of the equipment companies. So these are the equipment companies that currently sell color sorting technology for whole bottles. The difference in whole bottles is it's done at the front end, typically by the MRF, um, sometimes by companies like us that will debale the bales that you might sell us that are um, segregated and that you might sort by color. They take up a lot of space. If you can imagine, there are a lot of different colors out there. Um, just in white alone, we see over 200 different shades of white. So one has to make a decision if you're going to make a specific white or if you're going to blend all those different shades of white together. Um, if you were going to make all the different 200 shades of white, are you going to have 200 different conveyor belts separating those whites? So you can imagine the space that it would take up for a mill like Envision if we were to do the sorting on whole bottles. So Envision has chosen to sort on the flake form. But a lot of MRFs have this capability. In fact, some of your uh, technologies to sort by resin type include some of these technologies to sort by color. You might use it to sort the natural out of the colored HDP, and you might use that same technology to sort the clear out of the colored PET. You might not be really utilizing the technology you have in-house today to sort specific colors, but it could be an opportunity for you um, several years ago, I used to have a few of the suppliers to assort specific colors and make specific blended colored bales for me, and then I would just run those colors and make a muted color for a customer that would then color correct it into another color. And we paid them a little bit more money for that, and they saw the value in doing it, and it was worth their while. So that's an opportunity. As far as these pounds per hour and the accuracy, these are all quoted um, pounds per hour and accuracies given by these equipment companies. I can't attest to these um, pounds per hour or the accuracies. I can tell you that um, Envision on our own technology hasn't seen the accuracy or the pounds per hour that the equipment company has boasted that they could do with us. Maybe it has to do with keeping the equipment maintained. Maybe it has to do with the feedstock and the changes. That probably has a lot to do with it, but um, it's not that far off. <clears throat> These are the flake sorter technologies. Um, what's not listed on here is under key technologies, they just recently joint ventured with um, Vizi, which has come out with a new line called Cayman. And, um, that's one of the technology Envision uses, and you know we typically see around 85% purity of the accuracy of the um, throughput, and we typically only see about 5,000 pounds an hour. So you can see here where they said it's six to 13 tons per hour. <laughs> so that's just an example that these um, lines all boast that they can do a lot more throughput and better accuracy that they than they say they can. Having said that, doesn't mean that we don't get tremendous value out of um, the sorting technology that we get. Uh, we do, and we see great value in it, but uh, not quite what these equipment companies boast. So that's just some food for thought when you go into it, if you decide to buy any of these technologies. So these machines aren't cheap, and they aren't without their need for additional equipment. So whereas whole bottle sorters range from 100 and $20,000 to $400,000 each, that's not including all the auxiliary equipment that you might need. Um, and the flake sorters range from $140,000 to $650,000 each. Now, the whole bottle takes a much larger footprint, so you need a lot more overhead space to accommodate them. And I would say they take a lot more maintenance, whereas the flake sorters, is they're a little bit more sophisticated, but we didn't see near the wear and tear on them as we do the whole bottle sorters. 
Um, but what I would say is if you don't have some of this auxiliary equipment, they will not work. So for example, the whole bottle sorters, you can sort on dirty material. The flake sorters, you've got to sort once you've ground and washed the material so it's cleaner going in. Well, if it's cleaner going in, that's good because now your optic eyes are exposed to cleaner material. As long as you've removed the labels and the little fines and things like that, you're going to be exposed to in regular post-consumer material. So if you've not put in an aspirator prior to sorting these colors, you will gum up the, the optic eyes with label material and those optic eyes will not work. So the flake sorters aren't going to sell you the aspirator, so that's a, an auxiliary piece of equipment you're going to have to purchase, which is going to add on to your cost. So that's just an example that you've got to be aware of. But at the same time, if you're going to be a mill and you're going to recycle plastic into a resin, you should have that aspirator in place anyway if you're going to make a quality resin. Um, I will tell you that you can increase your throughput by putting in multiple machines because you can push the poundage and have less accuracy and improve the accuracy by having multiple machines and improving them by polishing them. In other words, the, the next machine after the next machine are going to be really working as polishers as opposed to being um, perfectly accurate at the beginning. So um, that's something that we've done is we've decided to put in multiple machines instead of trying to have one machine do everything for us and running it really slow. So as I mentioned before, um, we can see three to 4,000 pounds an hour with one machine and one pass and get 80 to 85% accuracy. But with multiple machines, we can easily get 5,000 pounds per hour but the best we've seen is about 95% accuracy and we've never seen 100% accuracy. <laughs> but all this is also contingent on the size of the flake and the positioning of either the bottles or the flakes as they're coming down the conveyor. So that's important to, as well. So there are both horizontal and vertical sorting machines when it comes to the flake. I mentioned that Vizzy has joint ventured with Key and they've come out with this horizontal machine if you look over at the end on the left hand side below there's kind of a little bar going across that's where the air pistons are shooting so basically at the top right that's a shaker table that's going to shake the flakes so that when they're starting to drop down on the conveyor bo below it's going to take a, a photograph of the flakes as they lay out that shaker table is really designed to make the flakes lay apart from each other so they don't overlap then the camera is going to take a picture every millisecond. It's going to send that picture to a computer screen. The computer screen is going to tell the air pistons below on that left when to shoot. But then again, I mentioned you're going to need that auxiliary equipment. So what you're going to have to add to that machine is conveyors to the right-hand side of that machine feeding that shaker table. And you're going to have to add uh, vacuums and some sort of a cabinet below the air pistons to catch those flakes if you're shooting at it or to catch the flakes if it's not shooting at it. So um, anyway, that's just a picture of what a horizontal conveyor looks like. And this is a vertical sorting machine. And what I like about the vertical machines is you can get the air pistons really close to the product that you're trying to sort. And um, I'm going to unplug my phone so that people can't call. And um, the negative about it is that those are slides that the flakes go down. And as I mentioned before, is you really want to get rid of all the, the labels and everything. And if you don't get rid of the labels or you don't get rid of the adhesives off the flakes from washing it, then those slides that the flakes are going to slide down and the cameras are right above those slides taking a picture. And then the air pistons are at right below the cameras. And then you can kind of see those boxes behind and so the air pistons are going to hit and if it hits it goes in the box behind it. If it doesn't hit it slides in the front and gets vacuumed down below it. Well those slides can get really gummed up if it doesn't get clean material in there. So if you don't have good clean material you will have problems um, sorting on the next one because usually what happens is on the left one after it goes through that first slot 
it will come back up and go down the next camera system and come back up and go down the next one. And so instead of having, let's see, seven sorting machines with seven cameras, that one machine is doing similar to what seven of those vertical, I mean, a horizontal machines would do. So I do like these um, uh, vertical machines, but there is a lot of uh, planned maintenance that you have to do as far as cleaning those slides because <clears throat> you will get angel hair buildup on them and you will get adhesive buildup on it. So here are some technology and potential solutions. Right now, as of 2010, there are 18 companies that make these auto sortation systems. They make both IR scanning and x-ray machines as well as color sorting systems. Um, and out of those 18, they have 52 different types of units that make it. Some of them are making both vertical and horizontal machines that do these sorting. Um, and as you'll see if you download the um, PowerPoint, I did list the name of all the companies and you're welcome to go onto all their websites and do some research if you want to investigate getting into some of those technologies. The other uh, technology that is growing today that you're hearing a lot about is plastics to fuel or making plastic pellets as well as plastics to wax is another growing technology and these are all new solutions to plastic waste uh, growing into the recycling industry. So next slide. So Envision's color sort technology we have patented is called Prisma and we like to say we don't just recycle plastic but we recycle the color. Um, we've been blessed since computers have improved when Union Carbide first developed this color sorting the pixels on computer screens for dialing in what colors to sort were so poor that they could only see 250 shades of uh, 250,000 shades of color. Today we can see 40 million different shades. So we're we've been blessed with improved computer technology. So we're much more sophisticated today, and have been able to enhance and improve upon Union Carbide's technology. We literally can uh, sort one million flakes per minute with the technology we have today. So we like to boast to people if they use 25% recycled content in a bottle with our Prisma color sorted technology, they should be able to reduce 25% of their colorant. But most of our customers are reducing 50% if they're using 25% of our color sort technology because the opacity in our color sort is so great that um, that's part of what the needs in bottles today is, is opacity. So we've been able to improve their colorant consumption by 50%. So that's one of the benefits we take to our customers in color sorting. So this is, um, this picture is really to point out, this is a typical mixed colored bale and what you need to see in there is look how much white there is. So white is most definitely the prominent color that's out there today. It represents about 20% of what's in a bale. And so most of the color sorted resin that we make today, we prefer to have some sort of shade of white in it because we can make more volume of it. So if you were to look at this bale and a customer came to us and said, can you make us 20 loads of dark green? It would take us probably 150 loads to run before we could make that 20 loads and it probably wouldn't be prudent for us, so we probably would have to say no. So there are some uh, technical issues in color sorting is there's just only certain colors out there in great volume. And uh, I have to hand my hats off to P&G. They certainly have the lion's share of the market. So tight orange is a big color and downy blue is another big color out there. So this is one of our horizontal machines and one of our older machines. And as you can see, it's got the shaker table that helps singulate the flakes and it drops down in that light over there is the camera system taking a picture. And just past that is the air pistons. And I told you about how it has a a box vacuum system below that that takes the material that we're shooting at and the material we're not shooting at gets vacuumed and goes to the next system. And since then we have bought a newer system. This is one of the newer ones that we actually have a three split. So we're able to do three different colors and inside that vacuum system where we're capturing the flakes, there's actually a bar in the middle of it. So we've got 
four slots. So we can have on the right hand side one color being sorted and on the left hand side another color being sorted and then on the far over side another sort of color is being accepted. So it's allowed us to do more sorting on one machine and it runs a little faster and it's a little more sophisticated. But again it's another horizontal machine. And then for most of our natural, we're running the vertical system with the slides. And as I mentioned, we're familiar with <laughs> how those uh, slides can get gummed up with label or adhesive and the maintenance on those, but we do like those machines. And then I mentioned that we use multiple machines so that we can run more throughput. So this is kind of just an overview of the different machines and the different feed hoppers taking the different ejects from each of the machines. So that's just an overview of the multiple machines that we have in our plant. And then this is just showing you inside those feed hoppers from the different machines. On the far left, we're making kind of a Kelly green and the far bottom right, we're making an orange and the top right, we're making a pastel blue. And this we're making kind of a, well, it's a gain green, which on the next slide I'll show you what it looks like in the pellet form. So all those colors mixed together make the gain green. And uh, so we sell into the gain green fabric softener bottle and they use, instead of using natural PCR that runs about three to four cents a pound more than our color sorted resin and their colorant costs them about six to seven cents a pound more to add to natural PCR, so we're saving them about 10 cents a pound on resin by making them color sorted resin. And here's just an example of that kind of darker green that we can make, but we can't make very much volume and it's sitting on top of a green handle. Um, just showing you what you can do when you mix all the colors together. You can, in a different type of products, not a bottle. And again, this is just showing you kind of the the boxes that we sort into and then the resin on the side and some of the bottles on the top right that we sell into our color sorted resin. And yes, Procter & Gamble is a big supporter of our color sorted resin. They, they definitely get the whole picture of it. In order to QC our material, um, the flakes that we sort before we extrude it into the pellets, we make sheet out of it to make sure that it makes the proper color. And this saves us a lot of time and money. So in order to feed an extruder and make pellets out of it, we might take two, 3,000 pounds worth of flake and then find out, oops, we made the wrong color. So we have this mini sheet line and we can find out whether we need to sort further or not. If we've got a good color coming into making the sheet, then we know we're ready to extrude. And this is in our lab. We keep a vial of all our sorted flakes that we make. Um, so that we can also look at a hand sample of the flakes before we extrude it and see if it matches the flakes that we've typically made for the colors that we've sold before. This is just kind of an overview of a lot of the colors that we've sold historically. Um, and you can see a lot of the colors, as I mentioned, have a little bit of white in it because we have a lot of white. So there's hardly any volume in the colors that don't have white in it because there's so much white in our bales. So why did Union Carbide see the need to color sort and why did we see the value in it? So if you look at 1993 when curbside recycling started to collect high density bottles in any significant volume. Back then you had about 2.6 billion pounds of virgin bottles being made in the United States and at that time you had almost 400 million pounds of bottles being collected for recycling. So you can see the number of natural was by far bigger than pigmented and part of that was because there was recycling legislation looming in California to, to mandate recycled content in all bottles. And back then everybody was looking at natural from milk bottles because you could color it whatever color you wanted. So the demand for natural was the highest at 24% and so it was recycled almost two to one natural versus pigmented. But if you look at the virgin sales, there are by far more virgin sales going into pigmented bottles than natural milk bottles at that time. So Union Carbide said, hey, you know, really the greatest potential growth is in mixed colored, but the problem is what are you going to sell it into? 
there's only so many black products that exist out there today. So the really the only way you're going to increase recycling is to come up with some sort of value for the colored bottles. So that's why they started developing this color sort technology. So what they did was they made an assumption, if we were to get to a 40% recycling rate, and you have to realize we were all hoping back in 1993 it would be easy to get to a 40% recycling rate, then we have a potential of a 300% increase with pigmented and only a 50% increase with natural. This is also, of course, assuming that 50% of the household recycles with a 70% capture rate, okay? So going on to the next slide, and we jump to 2012, it shows basically Union Carbide was right that pigment, pigmented did grow, but I, I also feel like pigmented did grow because we commercialized it. Envision came in 2001 when recycling really had stagnated, and what has grown the most over the last 12, 13 years is mixed color, and it has now surpassed natural. And I really feel like pigmented is surpassed natural because of color sorting. If we didn't sell what we sold into color sorting, it wouldn't have the market demand. And if you look at the value of mixed color, back in 1993, you were lucky to even get paid for mixed color. I mean, you're looking at zero to three cents a pound value for mixed color back in 1993. And today you're looking at 30 cents a pound value for pigmented bottles. So this is why I feel color sorting is important. It makes the value of that material that much more. So this is also showing you kind of over the history of years of recycling. And what this shows you is in 2008, we had a big drop of consumption of virgin pounds. This is partly due to Walmart saying that by 2013, we're going to have a reduction in packaging of 5%. And everybody answered their call, and they reduced the amount of detergent liquid in a bottle by concentrating all their fabric care products. And so that really reduced the amount of plastic consumed in the industry in 2008. And you can see it really has reduced with more light weighting. And we got a little bump between 2011 and 2012 of a whole whopping 100,000 pounds. But um, at least we're, we are seeing a slight increase in recycling. But if you look at that slight increase again, it's mostly in the mixed color. Um, you'd have to look at the recycling rate report to see that. It's carrying the natural. Um, again, along with color sorting, it's allowed us to get our Eco Prime sold into food packaging. And why that is, is not because we've been able to chemically clean the resin so that it's clean enough for FDA to approve it. That's a given. We had to do that. But the consumer product companies would not have taken our resin and accepted it into their packaging if it had not looked similar to virgin resin. And the only way we would have been able to do that is by cleaning the resin up, by removing the caps that milk bottles have on them, by color sorting it. So that's another reason for color sorting to be so important was to make that natural look similar to virgin resin. So we've come out with our Eco Prime which made our color sorting even that more important to us, which is why we put that new technology in, which has that um, vertical uh, sorting mechanism in it, because it was a little bit more proficient. We got a little bit more pounds per hour through it, a little bit more accuracy in it, and we were able to use one machine to do the throughput we needed um, to get the volume of EcoPrime through our system. So Envision now has this food grade that comes off of milk bottles, and you can kind of see on these bales a lot of little pieces of color, some of its label, some of its cap. Um, we basically take post-consumer baled milk, water, and juice bottles, and we grind and wash them and then color sort them to remove the caps and closures. And then after we've pelletized the material, we um, devolatize the resin to remove all the chemicals that were absorbed from any pesticide or oil bottles that might have ridden in the truckloads of bailed bottles that have been sitting next to the milk bottles uh, on their way to our mill. And these are just our patents and our LNO in case anybody cares, but we're approved for milk, water, and juice bottles, aqueous or acidic. What we're not approved for is pure vegetable oil bottles or alcoholic beverages. We never did migration tests on that because we never thought anyone would put vodka in a post-consumer resin bottle. So 
who knows, maybe we would pass if somebody wants to test the waters with that. And this is just an example of what non-sorted on the top row natural post-consumer resin looks like versus the next two rows is sorted um, with the caps removed and then the bottom row is the sorted but devolatized. So it kind of shows you what the different color variations and I know this is a little technical but it's real important if you're in the business of recycling resin um, to the customer and they definitely understand LAV values and interestingly enough when we devolatize the material it raises the L and the A and the B values even more we feel that happens because when you remove the chemicals that were absorbed maybe some of them were inks and it improves the brightness of the, the resin as well and then this is just showing you kind of what a typically sorted natural looks like so you still have some cap in there but most of it's removed and then that's a picture of the natural next to it. And the other side effect of making food grade is it takes the odor out of the resin. So there is, it's virtually odor free. So that's just envision bragging about some of our technology and devolatizing it. Unfortunately, in high density, it does like to absorb the perfumes of downy and Tide detergent bottles and things like that. So uh, EcoPrime's process does devolatize the odors out of there as well. And as I mentioned, I would share who some of my customers are. So you can see there's kind of a variety from pipe to toys, but mainly packaging. And, and the good thing about having packaging customers as an end customer is all of you guys wash your hair and wash your clothes all year long. And the other good thing is I have from uh, I would say blue chip to private label. So when the economy is bad, the private label business goes up and when the economy is good, everyone buys the blue chip uh, brands. But everybody, like I said, washes their clothes all year long. So, you know, we have demand pretty much throughout the year, uh, no matter what the season is. So that's the good thing about selling into these types of packages. But we also like the burst of demand that we get from, say, the flower pot or the pipe industry, as well as the toy manufacturers are somewhat seasonal, too, because they have certain times of years that the toy markets come out and they do their toy shows and then they get the orders and boom, they have lots of orders and we get lots of sales. Uh, so that's kind of an array of some of our different customers and I don't mind showing who they are. They're, none of them are easy. You know, we get a lot of people asking if we're certified, and I kind of feel like the, a list of our customers is a testimony of being certified because a lot of these are not easy to sell to without going through some sort of an audit process by these customers. And once you're in, it's hard to get out and, and somebody else to get in. So they're, not all of them are easy to be customers with or suppliers too. So we're proud of them, and we'd like to show them off. So why should we continue looking at sorting colors today? Well, I don't know if you've gone to the grocery store lately, but there's not as many natural bottles, especially in milk. If you notice, a lot of them are white and a lot of them are yellow. So part of the problem we're seeing is in order to defend the, I guess, the freshness of milk against the carton industry who claims that milk lasts longer in a carton, a lot of the milk industry has started coloring their milk bottles so there's actually less natural milk bottles available there's also a lot of people moving to soy milk and almond milk as opposed to drinking cow's milk so the demand on cow's milk is less so there's not as much cow's milk being sold so that too is lessening the amount of natural available for sale what we're also seeing is the average delta between the natural baled bottles and the mixed colored baled bottles is growing. In the 1990s, that delta averaged around seven cents a pound. Between 2000 and 2010, the average delta was about 10 cents a pound. Since 2010, we've seen the delta be about 13 cents a pound. So that delta is growing. So spending the money on sorting equipment to raise the value of that mixed color to a natural price is well worth it because you're being able to buy the scrap at a cheaper price and use that money on equipment to raise the value. So 
I'm just giving you an example of what's happening in high density. I think that's going to happen in other resins as well. Sometimes sorting these different colors is a way to sort and purify a resin stream as well. We've been doing some experiments with the floatables, and if you notice, um, the PET industry's floatables are mainly in history have been polypropylene, but since we've consumed more water bottles lately, and more water bottles are made with polyethylene caps as opposed to polypropylene caps, they've been struggling to move their floatables at as good of a price as they've historically moved them at because they've got polyethylene contamination. Well, most of those water bottle caps are natural in color. So imagine if you took those caps, ran them across one of these sorting machines in the flake form, and sorted out all the natural from all the colored, you'd probably have a pretty pure colored stream that would be predominantly polypropylene, and you'd probably have a pretty pure polyethylene stream on the other side that you could sell. So that's just an example of an opportunity someone could take advantage of. Also, we've seen a lot of growth in opaque PET, whereas predominantly in the 1990s you just had clear and translucent green PET, we now see a lot of opaque PET. What we don't see a lot of is markets for opaque PET, and I think partly is because there's just not that much black PET being consumed. So maybe somebody needs to look at opaque PET like Union Carbide looked at colored HDP and say, maybe there's an opportunity if we were to sort opaque PET and make specific colors, we could go back into specific colored PET. So there's one opportunity no one's taking advantage of. I mentioned the natural colored floatables in the PET recyclable um, stream. There's also white rigids from colored. So if you were to go into buckets and just sort the whites from all the colored ones, that white would have much more value. Or if you were to sort black from all the other colors, that would have more value. The other colors would be predominantly light in color. If you were to sort and add resin markers to all the different resins, we would have an opportunity to sort resins by type. We couldn't see those resin markers, but these machines that have already been built could see the resin markers, and we could sort resins by melt flow and type, and they would be done by color, but you and I couldn't see the colors, but these machines could. There's an opportunity to improve technology by putting these resin markers in there. They already exist. The Virgin Resin companies already put the markers in there so they can identify their resins by resin and by lot number. They just don't share with the industry what those resin markers are. But these machines that already exist could be programmed to look for those resin markers if somebody were to say, this is the resin marker used, look for it, and this is what it means. So there's some technology that we could use in the future for sorting resin types and resin melt flow. Um, we could be sorting white caps from amber polypropylene pill vials, and we could have a pure polypropylene amber stream and a pure white stream. That's another example. These are some of the things Envision's looked at, and we think there's opportunity there, and there's potential critical mass of these materials. And these are just things to, I guess, also sell our cause of why plastics should be recycled. I basically got this from the EPA website. There, if you go onto the EPA website, there's what's called a recon tool. If you click it, and this is, can be used for any commodity, so any of you could use it for any recyclable that you use. Anything that you use in a virgin form, if you replace it with a recycled and you plug that into that recon tool, the EPA website has assessed how much energy you're saving by switching to recycled. And so I took a pound of recycled versus a pound of virgin, and it shows that we save 90% less energy by using a pound of recycled versus virgin. And so this is just kind of a tool that some of my customers can use to promote using recycled in their packaging. And then the next slide is what we did with the APR. Is we got together and we did an LCA for our industry of uh, recycled. So it's something that Walmart wanted our industry to do so that they could put a value to recycled in their packaging. And they've just enacted that in 2013. And now Walmart's pushing really hard 
to all the packaging people to put recycled content into their packaging as part of the, the packaging scorecard. And so really this is just envisions executive summary because Franklin and Associates wouldn't do one because it's too political, but basically that's what this is. Um, so we have to absorb 50% of the energy that the virgin industry used. So the first time something gets recycled, it really doesn't have the savings that the EPA website showed. Technically, if you're going to take on the energy that the Virgin had on the first loop. So you're really looking at only about a 45% energy savings for the first round. But as you go multiple rounds and you get up to four times recycling, you got an 84%. If you don't take on that Virgin resin burden, then yes, you're looking at a 90% uh, energy savings. And so I just put that in there for people to use as tools, as people to sell if they're going to go and expand and get into some sort of recycling of plastic as a tool, since you'll now have this PowerPoint if you so choose to download it. And uh, the next slide is basically some more websites and tools. I mentioned you can go to Patty Moore's um, website to get some more of her publications on the rigid and the bail definitions. Um, and I look forward to hear some, hearing some of your questions. And thank you. Okay, thank you, Tamson. That was a very excellent presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions out there, but if, uh, if you do have a question, uh, please use the GoToWebinar dialog box. And so our, our first question is, uh, I know you focus a lot on, on containers and bottles. Uh, mm -hmm. This uh, this particular attendee is inquiring about film. Well, um, we do buy some of our equipment used, and some of our equipment has come from the tobacco industry. And so the tobacco industry is using it to sort the different grades of tobacco, which is very similar to shredded film. So I don't see any reason why that equipment can't be used to sort colors of film in the same way that um, the tobacco industry is sorting the tobacco. So basically they're chopping up the tobacco into little pieces like you would have in shredded film. Um, and they're doing that to make those different tobacco blends and then blending it together. Most of the sorting equipment that's out there today comes from the food industry. Okay. Yeah, I've heard a lot of issues with film is the, the contamination with, with dirt and, you know, if it's sag plastic, for example, mm -hmm. yeah, the dirt is, is a problem in contamination. Yeah, it does get embedded into the plastic. It, it depends on what your end market's going to be after. If you're going to go back into film, that dirt will be a gel in trying to make film again. Again, if you're going to take that film and use it as a modifier into another resin to injection mold it, it probably would be perfectly acceptable into a thick wall product. Mm -hmm. This question uh, states, do you expect the boom in U.S. natural gas production to affect plastics recycling? If so, how? Um, yes and no. I mean, I think certainly it's going to drive pricing down somewhat. But I think also what's going to happen is more and more, we're already seeing it, manufacturing is coming back to the U.S. So more demand is going to happen in the U.S. to absorb some of that additional resin that's going to be produced. And it means that there's going to be more recyclables available to us as well because we'll be gluttonous, right, and do more plastic packaging and we'll need more recycling and there'll probably be more legislation promoting recycling and recycle content so that it doesn't become in the landfill. So I think all in all, it might be a good thing. I hope we don't become gluttonous. Um, but from what I've been told, a lot of this demand or additional capacity that's coming online is just to handle the increased population that we're going to have, which is kind of sad. Even more so, it's supposed to really uptick our economy. I am concerned about the technologies going in for fracking and that we use the right ones because certainly we have never seen so many sinkholes in Florida before this night, 2013. I think there was 220 plus sinkholes in Florida. So hopefully that's not due to bad technology and fracking. Um, so we'll see. I do know that out of the 9 billion pounds of announced capacity, 3 billion pounds of them have been retracted. So. 
certainly our industry wants to make money and they're going to control supply and demand. Okay, this next question uh, asks you to elaborate on the plastics to wax technology and applications. Yeah, so right now there's a company called Green Mantra and they are licensing the technology and I think the first one's going in Baltimore. Um, so they're basically extracting um, the petroleum product out of the plastic and turning it into a wax. And the value for those waxes are in the thousand per ton range. So it allows them to pay a pretty competitive price for scrap plastic, not as competitive as a mill taking it to a resin that can go back into packaging like Envision, but certainly competitive to a commingled uh, price that was going into China, much better pricing than that, so somewhere in between. So I think you know they'll need a fairly separated material. Um, there are color-specific waxes and non-color-specific waxes. So, of course, if they can get to a natural or a light-colored wax, it has more value. But if it's a wax going into roadways, it has less value. So that's where the colors will go into. But you might want to Google green mantra, and you can learn a little bit more about those different values for the different colors. But they're all polyolefin-based. So it's either low-density, high-density, or polypropylene which is what they're consuming. Okay, next question is, what do you do with your waste plastics? Well, we were just like everybody else sorting out. We, we still sort out the PET and we sell that domestically to PET recyclers. And we are still sorting out the polyolefins that are injection grade. And um, we do still do some trial runs with them and, and sell that resin off when we have people willing and ready to work with us, but we have historically sold those bales to China, to be honest with you. Um, we were put at a halt just like everybody else back in March and April of last year. Um, so we stopped bailing them and we started bailing them up again probably mid-December. And um, we have been selling them domestically to somebody who is further sorting them from what we understand. So I think kind of like I have this dream of a perf, I think that is what this company is doing, is they're taking uh, our kind of commingled polyolefin, mainly injection grade bale, and sorting it further by taking the polypropylene from the polyethylene. Whether they're doing that manually or through some sort of a, a IR scanning system, I'm not sure my purchasing manager is handling the sale of that material and it is going domestic. Okay, uh, this question, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer it because it might contain some proprietary information. What chemicals are used in wash water and what is the treatment slash discharge process? How much water oh. is used per ton processed? Yeah, well, that varies from recycler to recycler, but um, we actually started in our early days using consuming about 150,000 gallons of water per day and back then we were probably recycling about 50 million pounds a year. Now we're recycling at this plant close to 100 million pounds a year, and we're probably consuming about 100,000 gallons a day. So we've reduced our water consumption by putting in new technology, and we've increased our capacity. So, you know, telling you specifically what that is is proprietary, so definitely technology can improve those things. We are using chemicals, of course, to uh, reduce our consumption of water internally so that we can reuse it. We have our own water treatment plant. Um, believe it or not, North Carolina is the most stringent water discharge plant, uh, state in the United States. We get measured in parts per trillion versus California, which measures us in parts per billion. So it's a thousand times more stringent than California and most states measure discharge in parts per million. So you can imagine it's quite a, an eyesore for us here in North Carolina, but we feel that overall we're doing what everybody's gonna have to eventually do, so we're happy to do it. But we've put in uh, you know, high centrifuges to remove water from solids and things like that to use less chemicals. So we've actually reduced our consumption of chemicals since 2001. 
and like I said, decreased our amount of water and improved on our chemistry. So it's a, it's a definite. And as far as washing goes, we are, um, you know, in our early days, we never used caustic because of that measuring parts per trillion. Believe it or not, in caustic, most caustic contains parts per trillion of mercury. Mm -hmm. um, but we have finally, in improving how we recover our wastewater, we've been able to add caustic to our wastewater or our wash process, which helps us clean our plastic even more. So we've been able to improve on our washing as well. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, the next question is, what would be the end market for e-waste plastic? What is the advantage of sorting printer plastic and computer plastic? Well, I'm not an expert in that, but I do know people who are, and I do know that there are some major printing companies that are involved in uh, recycling. I know Hewlett Packard does quite a bit in recycling. Um, Dell Computer even has their own recycling program if you contact them. Um, there, Jerry Powell has a list of electronic recyclers. It's pretty extensive. It's over 100 people. And then ISRI has an um, ownership of the Electronics Recycling Council, I think, which has a pretty big list as well of electronic recyclers. The positive of electronic recycling is if you can get a pure stream separated, and it was difficult to separate before because most of the IR scans couldn't detect a difference between polymers when they were black. And as you know, a lot of the uh, electronic plastics are black. But now there's new technology out there to distinguish between black polymers. Um, so they've got two different types of scans that can x-ray and scan, IR scan the plastic and distinguish between ABS and high impact polystyrene. Those resins are much higher value uh, resins than the commodity packaging resins. So whereas high density polypropylene PET all sell for less than a buck a pound, most of your electronic plastics sell for over a buck a pound. So that's where you get into some high value. You add to that if you recover the metals in electronic recycling, you know, it's a double whammy in, as far as revenue goes. So there's a reason there's so many electronic recyclers. So, you know, I'm not an expert at it, but there's certainly a lot of uh, companies who are, and I would reach out to them. Okay, this question has to do with uh, plastic lids, and they're stating mm -hmm. that the APR uh, advocated collecting or cl advocates collecting the plastic lids, and in the 1990s, the direction was to throw the lids away and just recycle yeah. the bottle. Yeah, yeah, I kind of hate that one myself, but I had to support it. I, and by the way, I'm no longer on the executive committee. This is uh, 2013 was my first year off the APR executive committee, but. Um, I'm still a member of the APR, and I'm still on the technical committee, but um, the problem is about 50% of the consumers were putting the lids on. So the question was, were these lids getting recovered? And most of them were getting recovered. And were we better off making it easier and telling people it's okay to leave the lids on? Or are we better off trying to get the 50% that we're leaving them on to get them off? And we felt like we'd have a more adversarial position trying to get them off and less participation. And we felt if we promoted that it's okay to leave the lids on, we might actually get more people participating in recycling if we told them it's okay to leave the lids on. Now, couple that with the Caps and Closures Manufacturers Association certainly wanted us to promote leaving the lids on. And the fact is, is at that time that we discussed it, this is before the concentrates came out. So before 2008, we started this dialogue. The average polypropylene content in a high density bottle, for example, was about 6%. So really, if you left the lids on and you didn't sort them out and you made a black resin out of it, the pipe industry could accept that and they didn't reject it. What we didn't anticipate was that the pipe industry was limit was 10% and that when we went to concentrates in 2008 that the new exposure to polypropylene because we shrunk all the bottles with concentrates but we didn't shrink the lids is now about 12%. So we are having a very trying time in our industry. There are a lot of rejected mixed colored loads because of too much polypropylene. Some of that polypropylene is from people salt and peppering 
the polypropylene containers in because they can't get rid of them in China. Some of it is from these big lids on smaller bottles. And um, so, you know, the question is, should we have done that? Probably overall, again, yes, because to me, it's our industry's job to come up with a solution for that. The downside is I think there are a lot of MRFs that probably have a difficult time bailing the bottles with the lids on there, and we might have made their life difficult by telling them it's okay to leave it on. And we did promote that it's up to your local market to decide whether lids are okay or not and to check with them. And just like it, we knew it was going to be difficult to tell those consumers that were leaving lids on to tell them to take them off, it's also been difficult to get people to call those local markets. So, you know, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. But personally, I have seen it be somewhat of a negative as far as quality in our market, leaving those lids on. Okay, this will be our last question. We're, we're running out of time. Uh, this has to do with the op optical sorting technologies and their, I guess, their reported uh, rejects of items like clamshells and, and hot cups. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, I would just throw in there thermoforms in general, uh, that technology keeping that those materials from being recovered. So do you have any comment on that? Well, I mean, I think that comes from the whole bottle sorting. So what you've got is in the early days, um, the IR scans recognize certain types of resin, and then they found out that the bottle guy said, but we don't want clamshells, and we don't want these injection molded tubs and stuff. So they started doing a two sort. They would take a picture of the container as well as do an IR scan. And if it didn't have kind of the shape of a bottle, it was another reason to sort it out. So um, I think now with clamshells and thermoforms becoming kind of the, the new feedstock in some PET recycling systems, some of the newer technologies are incorporating that shape into the acceptable stream. So that may mean a programming software upgrade that can be done. I mean, we have to do that on a regular basis and buy software upgrades in our color sorting technology. So when it comes to IR or whole bottle sorting, someone might want to check with their current technology and see if there's a software upgrade they can add to it. Um, or if they're buying some used equipment, see if there's a software upgrade that they can buy to add to it um, for that. If that's what that question means, I'm presuming that's what they're referring yes. to. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, very excellent uh, Q&A from the from the audience, and thank you for fielding those questions, Tamson. And uh, again, <laughs> yep, yes, very much. And uh, you see Tamson's contact information there. As you know, she disconnected her phone, so don't call her this afternoon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I actually got to plug it back in. Yeah, for, don't forget to do that. So again, thank you, Tamson, for taking the time out for uh, for doing this webinar. And uh, again, this webinar, like all webinars in this series, has been recorded and will be made available via YouTube links on both the National Recycling Coalition and Recycling Market Center websites. Uh, thanks again for joining us. We hope you'll join us for next month's webinar scheduled for Tuesday, March 18th, 1.30 Eastern Time. And have a great day, and so long.